Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here, and today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Max Ace Knives Babylon A, or I guess Babylon Automatic. So this is an automatic knife uh, operating with a plunge lock that can apparently be converted. If you look these up on, I think it's White Mountain Knives, it says these knives are currently in manual operating form or whatever and can be converted or they come with the parts that allow them to be converted. So I'm gonna attempt to do that today during the review and then I'll tell you guys what I think of the process, at least going from automatic to manual. Thanks so much to Max Ace Knives for sending this in for review. Thanks to my patrons for supporting me and please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. Let's go ahead and get a measurement of this knife. It's not a small knife. This is uh, obviously, you know, based on the Babylon model from um, Max Ace, which was a button lock. The Babylon 2 is the one that I handled. This is just shy of nine inches. It's like 8.9 inches. Blade length is coming in at 3.75. Cutting edge is also coming in at about 3.75, maybe actually even a little bit longer. You can see here where the cutting edge is you know, right there in the middle of the frame, like if we're measuring from there out to the tip of the blade, it's actually slightly behind. So uh, good ratios there. Let's go ahead and do a few size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1. And I've got all these put away. You can't see them off to the right is the NAFS Burrito, which is where I keep all of the size comparison knives. And usually they're laying on top of it for easy access. Today they're tucked in the pockets. Uh, so you can see here, this is definitely a larger knife. How about up against the Demco AD 20.5? There we go. How about up against the Spyderco PM2 and the Spyderco Para 3? There we go. And then last but not least, let's go ahead and put it up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue. And finally, the Benchmade Bug Out. All right, there we go. Let's talk about action. And then I think what I'm gonna do since <laughs> The manual, you know, setup would also, we'd also need to talk about the action there. Um, I'll go ahead and attempt to disassemble it from this point forward. But first, the automatic action. It's okay. It's not gonna be as powerful as a ProTech and certainly nowhere near as powerful as something like a Microtech Stitch. I think the coil spring on the inside of the pivot is just kind of a, it's kind of a weaker one. But, you know, my test always is, can I hold the button down and just pull the blade back just a little bit? Is the force enough to keep that blade springing back out into the open position? And the answer is yes. It's, uh, I would say it feels very medium. It doesn't feel like the lightest fire, you know, the lightest firing side opening auto that I've, I've ever felt, but it's certainly nowhere near the strongest. It'll get the job done, but you're not gonna get that. I mean, if this is your first automatic knife ever, side opening automatic, you'll probably be really impressed with it. If it's not, and you've experienced tons and tons of Protex and Microtex, you're gonna go, eh, bleh, you know, kind of bleh. It's, uh, it's okay. Um, let's go ahead from here, and it'll be um, kind of chopped up, because otherwise it would be a very, very lengthy video. I'm gonna go ahead and take this thing apart and see what we're actually dealing with here. Okay, so here's the inside of the knife. Uh, lots of bearings, and then we of course have, let me take this off this side. It looks like there's the coil spring right there. So, take that out. You know, it really doesn't look like a teeny tiny coil spring. I, I suppose the, the one that I took out of the, um, I think there was a time that I took it out of the Microtech stitch or something like that. Um, and maybe it was a little more robust. I honestly can't remember. Um, but from this point forward, I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to put it back together, um, you know, and, uh, and have it operate manually.
Okay, <clears throat> I've got it all taken apart. Some uh, the thing, some things to note. Um, it really wasn't all that difficult. Uh, these front screws are actually Chicago screws, and these back ones go all the way through. Max Ace, I think you probably should have done D-shaped barrels. They came apart pretty easily, just with general, you know, tension. But uh, like tension held them in place. Um, but uh, doing a D-shaped barrel or something to keep them captive probably would have been a better idea. Um, but okay. Um, so now we have this manual, uh, you know, button lock operating knife and um, something that um, unless I did something wrong, which I'm, I, I know there's going to be speculation, but I'm, I'm very confident that I did not because you can see how this plunge lock locks up, right? That slides into that little area right here. That means there is no way to release this blade via the opening hole. That's what I thought. I thought, and, and I don't, you know, I, I guess maybe, I, maybe I should have seen this coming. Um, it doesn't release, <laughs> it doesn't release all, there's no like ramp or anything. It, I mean, it's locked into the closed position, obviously because of how this operates as an automatic knife, because you wouldn't want there being a little bit of slippage allowing that coil spring, which is under tension to just throw the blade at any time. So of course... When the thing is set up for manual operation, of course you wouldn't be able to just overcome the plunge lock and the tang of the blade acting as the detent and just reverse flick it, right? And a lot of people's brains are going to go to work right now and think, no, that cannot be possible. I'm telling you, yes, it's actually the case. This is meant to be locked down in the closed position, so the only way to get it to deploy is by pushing the button. Now that works. Um, but the question remains, why is this here? Why? Like, why even have it there at all? I guess it's kind of like, you know, the Microtech stitch situation. We have an automatic Microtech stitch with the hole in it that's apparently just there for looks. Fortunately, they do make the Babylon, which I think is actually still floating around, like the Babylon 2, the manual button lock version, and it does deploy that way. I think they're part of the area where the plunge lock sinks into place is like sloped so it allows you to overcome it right when you're trying to flick it or reverse flick it but as it is right now this doesn't it's not possible that it will open uh, funny enough you can actually double lock it by you know because this this secondary lock still operates we didn't really talk about that it does have a secondary lock and it still operates this has a big um washer on one side and then it's got bearings on the other so you can operate it, but this isn't going to feel like luxuriously smooth or anything like that. I mean, it feels pretty uh, I, I think that it, it it's kind of a meh automatic and it's kind of a meh manual knife, right? I mean, it's if you really like the whole conversion thing, the, I guess the best the best thing that I can say is is that it was it was shockingly easy to do. The only issue that I had was pushing that coil spring back down, right? You, I have to do the first scale, then the blade, right? So the, this uh, phosphor bronze washer, then the blade, then the bearings, and then you need to put the uh, button or the plunge lock in, but that cap sits on top of the coil spring and pushes it down. So you have to hold that thing in place and then sort of maneuver this scale on top of it without launching the cap off into the freaking mesosphere so that's a little bit of a pain but honestly i mean that was one of the easiest disassembly processes i've ever been through uh you know when it comes to an automatic knife i don't know why this one was so much easier i would imagine putting the coil spring back in will probably be much harder converting it from manual to automatic will be much harder um but uh it's, it's doable definitely so there you go the action's mediocre as an automatic knife and even less impressive as a manual knife. Uh, I'm gonna move that out of the way. Let's go ahead and do carry profile. So thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3, you can see here, it gets relatively, relatively thick. I mean, it's not super thick. It just gets a little thicker than the Para 3, I guess. Length and height up against the PM2 and the Para 3. You can see here, this is still a pretty big boy, longer even than the PM2. And in places, almost as tall. 
Um, so you you might notice it in the pocket. I don't know that you, I mean, it, it's going to feel fairly light for such a large knife because the body is primarily carbon fiber. Um, we'll go ahead and weigh it here. The weight on this guy is coming in at 3.92 ounces. So yeah, honestly, very impressive. A nearly one to one ratio for blade length. Uh, an, an inch of blade for an ounce of weight. We have 3.9 inches of blade for 3.9 ounces of weight. That's pretty awesome. So that's nice. Um, I keep thinking it's manual. You really are gonna have to like risk this thing out. Okay, um, let's see here. We do need to, oh yeah, materials used. So we have uh, M390 for the blade, no shock there. And then we have this uh, sort of combo carbon fiber and I think honestly think that it's like a combo carbon fiber G10, um, not a laminate, but sort of like a Damascus of sorts. <laughs> it's interesting. It's cool. It makes the knife really lightweight. There's no extra titanium on it outside of the pocket clip. Um, the inside has a very thin, and I think it's actually the mounting piece. Yeah. There's just a little tiny piece of steel in there, and it's basically just the mounting we get it. Yeah, it's just the mounting piece for the um, the lock. Uh, so outside of that, it's all carbon fiber. That's fine. It's plenty strong. Um, we'll go ahead and measure blade stock thickness here real quick. And yes, I know that blade is off center now. Um, that's just the product of me taking it apart. We'll talk about that here in a sec. Blade stock thickness is coming in at 157,000. So on the thicker side, but nothing surprising for Max Ace. Um, speaking of things that are surprising, I didn't talk about this. The screws are T7. I tried multiple times to get a T8 in there. Uh, so the T, this is a T7. The T8, no, sorry. Is this it? This looks like, oh, the T8's in the, sorry. The T8 is in the, uh, the deal here. So this is a T8. Absolutely will not, you no, know, you know what? I'm, I'm stupid. <laughs> I tried three times. I couldn't get a T8 in here, and I was like, what's going on? Is this actually a T7? All right, never mind. It, it's a T8. Sorry. So we have T8 and T8. <laughs> Idiot. Idiot. All right. I was about to inform everybody. I was like, listen, this is a T7, so you need to watch out, because I tried, and I did It's a T8. Okay. Uh, let's see here. What do we got left? Nothing. Let's move on to the meat and potatoes. This is the Babylon. It feels very similar, of course, to the Babylon 2. It's got pretty darn good ergonomics and feels pretty good. Honestly, as a tool when this thing's locked out, I think you're pretty much good to go. The ergonomic lines are pretty good. The pocket clip is not super prominent. It's also flat. It's almost too shallow, to be honest. But it's nice and flat and rounded off at the edges. The edges of the handles or the, the, the sort of, you know, the, the ergonomic shape of the scales mixed with the chamfering uh, create for a very good ergonomic uh, experience. A little bit of a choke up spot. I would, you know, be careful about that. You're pretty close to the edge. Not a lot of indicator before you slice your finger. Um, and then as far as, you know, the blade geometry goes, I think it's all right. It tapers down to a fairly thin cutting edge. Max Ace does a good job with a blade. Um, so for continuous work, honestly, um, that, you know, something else to be said about Max Ace button locks or plunge locks, this thing is freaking solid. It's absolutely locking up. I can't, I can't get it to flex, which is impressive considering, you know, the material it's flexing against is not titanium. It's carbon fiber and what I assume is G10. Uh, mixed in there. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the blade is a simple bead blast. Uh, it's nothing special. Looks fine. Um, I, I mean, at least it looks like a very, very light blasting. Uh, it says Babylon A M390 2023. The blade is, I'm going to call it reverse tanto. There's at least one guy who always gets super upset with me when I say reverse tanto because apparently it's not the right history and something about the American tanto and the Japanese. I got to be honest. I have never read the whole paragraph that the guy leaves me every single time and I just don't really care. So, here's a message from me to you, guy. I'm gonna keep calling these things reverse tantos and you can keep leaving paragraphs for nobody to read. I'll still be your friend. Anyways, um, yeah, reverse tanto and then we have, like I said, reasonably you know thin down at the cutting edge, you know, considering how thick the blade actually is. 
as far as you know, doing your daily cutting tasks and even some things beyond that, I think it'll be just fine. I, I don't think that this is the type of knife that's going to stand up to any major abuse. But you know, long term, like sort of continuous cutting tasks uh, that involve like thicker materials, like really thick cardboard, styrofoam, rubber, uh, rope, even wood. Yeah, I think you're going to be just fine, right? Maxis uh, heats treats their M390 a little bit low, uh, as far as I remember. Um, I remember seeing at one point it, they they were like 58 to 60. I think they're actually 59 to 61, which is seems to be the industry standard. I always maintain that we should be hitting 60 at a bare minimum, and it should go up to about 62. Uh, but that's not what companies do. So uh, 59, there's a 33% chance you'll get a 59, which is definitely poo poo town. There's no arguments to be made for that. People will try, but there aren't. That's just too soft. You're losing the benefit of M390. You're losing the benefit of the balance of the composition, the the um, you know what the composition is designed to do, which is balance corrosion resistance with really great edge retention. But you don't get that edge retention unless you're hitting at least 60, preferably 61, 62. So anything below that just turns it into a mediocre stainless steel that's got some extra toughness for that specific composition, but pretty mediocre toughness running up against its generally competitive compositions. Um, in other words, it's pointless to heat treat it lower than 60. And even 60, a lot of people will maintain 60 is too low, 61, 62. So um, yeah, uh, you, you have a 33.3% you have a chance of getting a poo-poo town heat treat. And then uh, you got to, you know, the rest of it is anywhere from mediocre to pretty good. If you get a 61, that's pretty good. There's no way to tell without having it tested, though, unless you want to cut test yourself. Um, not on yourself. I mean, cutting, like, if you want to use the knife and do a cut test on, like, manila rope or cardboard or something. Anyways, <laughs> there is only, uh, it's kind of neat. We have a seam construction, and these, you know, when they're done correctly, they look pretty good. The seam on this is great. I took it apart, put it back together, and everything lined back up. It looks all right. Kind of gives it that integral look without actually being integral. We have a little bit of a lanyard bar back here. That's great if you like lanyards. I don't, so I don't really care, but it's there. Uh, we have a pocket clip that is milled titanium. And there's a hidden screw holding it in place underneath. That's nice, but no uh, position for lefties. Sorry, lefties. That's a bummer. Stop pin located in its traditional spot. A little bit of shouldering there. Like I said, no blade play up, down, left, or right. A little teeny tiny bit of stick. I imagine that'll work itself out. Um, we have no pivot lash. It's, I wouldn't call it, I mean, it, it's, it's consistent. I wouldn't call it super duper smooth by any stretch of the imagination, right? This is much more of a detent because, you know, as is not normally the case with uh, these plunge lock knives on it, like a regular manual button lock, you have more of a ramp. So there's a little more of a blap, right? This is much more of a click because there's like a 90 degree ledge that it falls into. So there's no hope of like getting it back out like this unless you push the button to release it. I hope I'm painting the right picture. Uh, I put it back together and it did not automatically go back to center. I am almost certain that I could adjust it. Obviously, if it was centered once, it can be centered again, though not having the coil spring in there might have something to do with that. So there's a chance that I'm wrong and it won't go back center, which would be a real bummer. Um, the idea of having, um, you know, a, a knife that can be changed from manual to automatic is pretty cool. And when I unbox this, I asked the question, how the heck are they getting this done? Because this is made in China. Well, that answers the question. Um, they, uh, ship you the parts to do it. I mean, mine came ready to go. <laughs> so they shipped mine in auto form, but I think they're supposed to ship them manually and then you can convert them to automatic if you want to. I think the idea is cool. And by the way, what's the price on this? 188 bucks, which I don't think is unfair uh, considering everything that's involved here. Um, I wish that it had, you know, I don't know, a little bit something more. I wish it. I wish they had done like a titanium backspacer. I think that would have been cooler than doing the seam construction, right? Um, the the G10. If, if this is a G10 and carbon fiber combination, that doesn't really do it for me. It looks okay, right? But it does make it lightweight, so I guess that comes down to preference. I just wish that there was a little bit more something there. But the price isn't the worst thing in the world, especially considering you know everything that's involved here. It's cool that we have um, an automatic that can be converted to a um, manual. If uh, and I don't know how they would have done this, but if they could have made it uh, so that you could deploy this thing using the hole right? 
uh, when it's in manual form, that would have been awesome. Um, and if they also used a more powerful uh, coil spring or a, a thicker, you know, a coil spring with more tension, that also would have been cool because it would have created for more of a, you know, that that, satis that satisfying action that we all look for in uh, premium side opening automatic knives. Um, my honest take on this is I, it, I pass. Um, it, it's it's interesting. It's not my favorite. I mean, it's far from my favorite thing from Max. Honestly, I think pretty much everything else that Max Ace has sent has been more impressive. Uh, just go with the manual one, right? I mean, you have to really want the freaking. You have to really want the automatic version of the. You have to be like, I love the Babylon, and my favorite thing in the whole world would be if they did an automatic one. That is the only person that that's for. If you're just obsessed with the Babylon, but your ultimate dream is that it's automatic, but you still have the option to convert it back to manual, then yeah, then go for it. They're not nice for you. For literally everybody else on the planet, just get the freaking regular Babylon. It like that's a way better knife. In fact, it's a really great knife. Um, Maxis makes incredible stuff. This is the this is one of the only times I've ever felt kind of let down by it. Right, so. It's okay. Not my favorite. I mean, I say it's okay. If I was going to give this a letter grade, I'd give it like a C minus, right? It's not a bad knife. Like everything works. It just doesn't work very well. So C minus, C at best, right? I'm trying to be a nice teacher here. <laughs> That's going to be pretty much it today. I'll link it. I'll link this thing down below. You guys can check it out if you want to. Thanks again to Max Ace for sending this in. This is probably a knife that I'll end up giving away. I will ship it with the parts, you know, when I do give away, I'll probably ship it with the parts to turn it into an auto. I probably won't ship it as an auto because, you know, all that the legal stuff. But anyways, um, that's going to be pretty much it today, guys. Thanks again to Max Ace for sending this in. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.